Good morning, good morning. How you guys doing? My name is Ben Miller, lead pastor here at Joy Church, and it is a great day to be here. Thank you for being with us. Today, I'm looking forward to the content of the big four, four beliefs that shape every decision. Uh, this is actually, the content behind this one is, um, we have, I've actually preached this before, but it's been almost two years since I preached it, and we find that we use this quite often. I use it, I would say, almost every week, I feel like the content comes up, and so as we've gone over it and over again, they're just like, hey, could we re-hit this and go over it one more time, just because it, it actually is really, really, really good. It's pivotal and foundational to everything that we do, so thank you for being here today. Uh, Easter was amazing. Thank you for being a part of that, everybody. Uh, my highlight since Easter, just because you guys really need to know, is I watched the new Super Mario Bros., it was so good. It was so good. How many guys, anyone else partake in it? It was awesome. I loved it. So if you're looking for something to do after this, you should go to the movies. It was a great movie. They did a good job connecting with the old Super Mario Bros. I know some of you guys are like, I thought I was going to church today. No, no, you weren't. You were coming to hang out. So uh, it is awesome. I would encourage you to watch it. It's worth it 100%. And it was a highlight of my Monday. So uh, it should be the highlight of your Sunday if you go watch it today. Totally worth it. Hey, how many of you guys remember your favorite class in high school? Anyone? Remember some of you guys? High school. Some of you guys remember high school? Any of you guys? Some, some of you guys are high school? Are you kidding me? That's a long time ago. Uh, my favorite has, class in high school was obviously anatomy as a kid. It's a joke. It was a joke, guys. Like, you can, <laughs> you can laugh. It's like a high school boy. Of course it was anatomy. The, uh, no, you... Okay, you guys are going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. I'm trying here. I'm trying. Okay. Be, okay, honest truth. Uh, best, best class for me in high school. I really, really loved sociology. I know. And that one wasn't a joke. That was legit. You guys you guys, like, what? You don't, you don't even know what that is. Sociology is the study of human social behavior. Anyone else love that class? Anyone loves, love watching people just to be like, this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. Just wait. They're getting madder and madder. It's going to happen. It's, they're going to explode. And they exploded. Like, I loved, I, I really love that class, sociology, um, just because really it was the study of human social behavior. I was always fascinated with it. And uh, I felt like the class put into words maybe a love or a desire that I had to maybe better understand self, better understand people. But to me, the study of, of really human behavior and group behavior has always been like a passion for me. Books like Spy the Lie, Never Split the Difference, What Everybody Says. Like, I love those things. I love learning about uh, human social behavior. Everything about it completely fuels me. And I realized in that class that that was a passion of mine to just study people and to know how, how everything has worked or how God created everybody and how it all fits together. It's a passion that really was in line with my purpose. My purpose um, is to lead and feed God's people. I'm, I'm a pastor. I love it. It's not a job to me. It's a calling. It's what God's called me to do and gifted me to do. And it's actually the way in which I get to make a difference in the world. All of that, no joke, was ignited in high school for, through some wool, sock, and sandal, liberal, hippie sociology teacher. So who knew, huh? <laughs> who knew some crazy guy like that would just ignite a passion uh, to, to learn more about this stuff? But it's true. When you study human social behavior, you learn to identify what we call core drivers or core motivators that every single one of us holds, all mankind holds together. And what you can do is build a commonality or unity between people. I just lost half of you. I'm telling you, I know that. You're like, what did he say? Like, am I back in high school? No, it's okay. The reality is, and this is what I'm trying to say, is that all of us have certain things in common. We all share commonality. One of the things that we share in common is a desire to live well. Wouldn't you say that? Anyone have a desire to live well? Like, I really want it to go well. So, like, four of you really want it to go well for your life. <laughs> That's awesome. Let me try this again. How many of you just would like it to live well? Anyone? <laughs> healthy body, healthy mind, healthy soul. Like, we all should share, share that in common. That's our primary goal. Secondary really is to live well with others. When you realize in order for you to live well, most of the time it's connected to the other people in your life. Who would a teacher teach to? Who would, I mean, who would a doctor help? Who would, uh, who would listen if nobody was, who would play music if nobody was there to listen? Like, it's always better when your passion, desire is connected with another person. And so our primary is to live well. Our secondary, we recognize often for us to get our primary is to live well. We do it with others. 
We connect with others. We, lo- we love others. Like there is a beauty in how we were created to live well and to live well with others. That's the primary goal. I'm hoping every single one of us would say, yeah, I would like that. I have yet to meet someone who's like, I just, I don't want it to go well with me. You know, like I'm trying really hard and, and, and it just keeps working out and I don't want it to work out. Uh, no, we all have this drive for it to go well, which means this. The point is that desire drives everything. There's a desire in you, a want, a push inside of you that wants to live well and wants to live well with others. So desire is the motivator inside of all of us that continues to push us forward, push us forward. But we also want desire to lead to fulfillment. I don't know a single person that's like, man, I really desired this and I just hope that it leads to disappointment because fulfillment is driving me nuts. I'm just so over this fulfillment. No, I, I, I really want disappointment. No, we all want desire to lead fulfillment. The desires that we have, we want to see them come true. We want to see them actualized. We want to see them work. When you build something, you want it to work or look beautiful. You don't want it to lead into disappointment over and over again. These are commonalities that we have, which means herein lies the issue, is that desire doesn't always lead to fulfillment. You and I can share a common desire and show up at a completely different place. Someone can show up disappointed and someone can show up fulfilled. And so there's a disconnect between desire and fulfillment, although we all want it to lead to fulfillment. And when we look at our lives, sometimes you go, man, we were both chasing the same thing. One of the best is when you look back at high school and maybe your four top friends at high school and you realize it turned out different for everyone. Not everybody turned out the same, yet maybe you had a moment in high school where you all talked about it. Man, this is what we want to do. We want to grow up. We want to, you know, we want to, we want to meet the woman of our dreams. We want to make this thing happen. We want, to, we want to live well and live successfully. But when you look back even at your high school years, maybe some of you are not even in high school, but someday you'll look back at those years and you'll realize not everything turns out the same. Just because you have a desire doesn't mean that desire comes to a fulfillment. There's some kind of disconnect between desire and fulfillment. So the question is, what lies between desire and fulfillment? Anyone? What's the link between desire and fulfillment? It's belief. It's on the screen. We, I, I tried to give it to you. It was, you can go back one. It was on, it's, it's in the title of the message. Like, like belief. Could you go back one more? In the title of the message, four beliefs. No, we're going to go forward one. You guys are awesome. Forward, there, back, forward, no back, no back, forward. You can do this. There, you got it, perfect. Four beliefs that shape every decision. The difference or the link between desire and fulfillment and desire and disappointment is often a belief. Because what you believe leads to the choices that you make and what you choose leads to the fulfillment or the outcome. Now the next one. The reality is for each and every one of us, when we look at this, we all have a desire and it can be common desires, but we all believe differently. We all make different choices that lead to an outcome. And when you look back at your friends in high school, you can look at that for sure. Maybe we all shared the same desire. We were all going to be professional football players. And some of them believed this is going to happen. You believed it's probably not going to happen because look at me, you know. Uh, And then we made choices based off of those decisions. And then we all are living with the outcome of that decision. The... uh, The reason I'm walking through this, you might be like, where in the heck are we going with all of this, is that you need to know is that we all share desire, we're all praying for fulfillment instead of disappointment, but what you believe really matters. Because belief is the link between the value or the desire that you have and the outcome or the fulfillment. Belief is the link between desire and outcome for you personally and for our society. And I don't know where you are in your walk or where you are in your lifetime, but I can tell you as a society, we can no longer hide the fact that the outcome that we are living is nowhere close to our desire for what we want to live our life for. Like when we look at our society, you think to yourself, I don't really think that's what we were hoping for for society. Like I think our there's a massive disconnect between what we desire for our society and what we're living for our society. Not only do we experience that in our own life sometimes where you realize like, I don't, this isn't who I wanted to be. This isn't what I wanted it to turn out. You realize there's a disconnect. The disconnect or the link between the two is belief. And so at some point, we chose to believe something that caused us to act in a certain way that walked us away from really the value or desire to live and live well or to live well with others. And now we're experiencing based off of not, not 
desire, but based off of belief, we're experiencing something that we're thinking, I don't like the outcome. And maybe you're at a place in life where you're thinking to yourself, I don't like the outcome. I've given it my best go, and I've pushed hard. I've done everything I can. But when you look at it, what you desire in life, you're so far away from. Or maybe you're right on track, and you're doing really, really well. Hosea 4.6 says this. This is Old Testament scripture. It's amazing. It says, my people are destroyed. This is God. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you rejected knowledge, I rejected you from being priests to me. This is a really tough verse. There's going to be some good truth in this today. The reality is, is that so many times we want to blame God for rejecting us. But the way that this sentence is structured is that we first chose to reject knowledge or truth. And when we rejected truth, truth rejected us, and all of a sudden now we find that we're being destroyed. Yet we're going to blame God for all the problems that we have When the reality is, he said, it's because you rejected knowledge. This is him speaking to his people. That word knowledge is actually translated from the word truth, but it also is translated the ability to distinguish good and evil. When you rejected truth, you lost the ability to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, you actually don't know up from down and left from right. Now, all of a sudden, you're being destroyed by the fact that you rejected truth. Romans says it this way in Romans 1, 22, or 21 and 22. I'm going to read you a few sections here. Romans 1 is excellent, by the way. It says this, Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Continues on in verse 24 to say this, So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. We live in a society that has traded the truth about God for a lie. And so they worship and they serve the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. And the result in Romans 1, 28 says this, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should have never been done. It's not just what we believe that matters. It's actually what we believe about God that matters. And may I propose today that the the link between your desire to live well and live well with others and fulfillment of that desire is not just belief, but it's actually what you believe about God that either links you to disappointment or fulfillment. And is it possible that we live in a generation that has chose to think differently about God and therefore is now reaping the rewards of everything that they've believed and the choices that they've made? And I say this about our society as if I'm standing and talking about society. The reality is it's each and every one of our lives. We are that society. And there are areas in our life in which we choose to believe less of God, and all of a sudden we're feeling the results of that. We're not feeling fulfilled, we're feeling full of anxiety, full of pain, full of anger. Like we have a world that has a record, a record amount of brokenness. Is it possible that that brokenness is coming from the fact that we've believed something wrong about God, and now all of a sudden God has abandoned us because we chose to trade truth? about God for a lie. I want to give you four beliefs that, um, that I feel are foundational. And I, and I, I know that um, maybe you've, uh, if you've been in church, you've heard like statement of faith. Here's what we believe. Here's, here's our, our core doctrines. You've heard maybe stuff like this. But before you actually can look at a statement of faith or what the Bible is saying or what the belief is, you actually have to step back and look at your framework by which where you put this. This is uh, four beliefs that shape every decision. This was created out of the idea that to, when we started looking at it, I'm thinking, well, man, where do we get back to? How do we get back to the beginning? All of these are taken out of Genesis 1 and chapter 2. Why? Because if you don't believe the first two verses, you won't believe any of it. And if you look at it, this is what I feel or what we can see that our, our culture, our society, and our world has walked away from. They're very simple, but I want to walk through each one of them. These are four beliefs that shape every decision that we make, if you choose. These are, these are beliefs that you get to choose. I can't choose them for you, and uh, you can't choose them for me. 
But these are four beliefs that shape every decision. The very first one is in the beginning, God created all things. This is Genesis chapter 1 at the very beginning. I want to read it to you. Genesis 1.1, the very first sentence of this book, great book. By the way, if you haven't read it, you should try. It's awesome. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that. I choose to believe that. And I, I choose to stand on that and not let anything change that. that. It wasn't by accident. It didn't just happen. It didn't morph. It didn't bang. It didn't explode. It didn't do any of that stuff. In the beginning, God spoke, and in the beginning, he created all things. We know this because the very next chap, uh, verse says, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered over the deep waters. There was literally nothing there. there was, it was meaningless, void. There was no purpose, no intention. It was just void. And then all of a sudden, he started creating. The second one is that God created everything with purpose, meaning intentionality. So in the beginning, verse 2, you can see the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered over the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over these waters. And then what you find, if you continue to read from verse 2 all the way to 27, is that then God spoke and created this, he spoke and created that, and he had intentionality in everything that he created. And when we walk around and we look at this earth, you can see intentionality. I can see intentionality in every tree and every blade of grass and every water. You can see it in people. You can see it in animals. Every single thing that we see that was created, and we can see with our eyes or experience or touch, the reality is it was all created very much with an intention and purpose. And we can see the intention and we can see the purpose very, very clearly, the reality is that design often reveals purpose. So when we can see purpose and intentionality in all things, you go, hey, that means this must have been built for a reason. I've even asked some people who don't believe God exists. I, I like to always start with the question, um, when you look around at the world, is it possible, like when you look at trees and grass and animals and all this, is it, is it possible, probable, possible, that something created it? And most of them say, yeah, okay, well, if something created it, is it possible that it had a purpose behind creating it? Yeah. Number one and two. In the beginning, God created all things. Number two, God created everything with a purpose. Everything has intentionality. Number three, God created everything for a purpose, which is different. It's a, it's a completely different thing with purpose and for purpose. For purpose is the action of that thing as opposed to the purpose intentionality of it. Like you can look at a beautiful car and you can see that it was built with complete intention, but it's not until you get into that car and use it for its intention that you realize, oh, that's awesome. You know, I'm so thankful I don't have to ride a donkey. Anyone, anyone else? Like, like, I'm really happy with that. I'm like, hey, I like it. This is awesome. I'm cool with the purpose an intention of how that thing was created. And, uh, and you can see in Genesis 1, 28 through 2, 3, you can see where he all of a sudden now moves from then God said and built it to all of a sudden he moves into the then God blessed it. And he said things like, now he commands it, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, govern it, reign over. He starts to actually speak intentionality and purpose into the different things, humans and everything that's, that's on here, even into the days. Then God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God finished his work from creation. He rested from all his work and then he blessed intentionality of blessing the seventh day and he called it holy he blessed the days of the week he blessed rest and work he blessed everything he actually brought intentionality and purpose into all things so we believe that god was the beginning created all things he created them with a purpose he created them for a purpose and then this is the one that most people wrestle with why mainly because we hate it <laughs> it doesn't suit me it doesn't i don't like it you know he alone makes the rules Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, then God placed the man, mankind actually is translated from, mankind in the Garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. But the Lord God warned them. He warned them and he said, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat its fruit, you will surely die. That's like on Super Mario Brothers, game over. Do, do, do. You don't get three lives, you get one. Game over. He gave them a warning. He set the rules. The reality is, is that we believe God created the board. He created the pieces. He created the rules, and he set everything in motion. And just because you disagree with the rules doesn't mean that the rules aren't there. And you can't have house rules. 
Some of you guys have house rules when you play games at your own. Well, this, our special house rule is this. Why? Because I don't like the real rules. Well, you can make your own game. That's what you can do. But the game that you're currently in, you didn't get to set the rules. You didn't create the pieces. You don't get to pick the design work. You don't get to do any of that stuff. The reality is, is that you exist in a world that he created. He created everything around you with purpose. He created you and everything around you for a purpose, and he gets to make the rules. This is what we call a Christian worldview. This is the framework by which we view truth. When somebody asks the question, well, what is truth? Well, truth has to be viewed on this. This is the framework by which you can now say, how does truth work or operate or exist? Because if you're trying to create truth, this is your truth. It's one piece of the puzzle trying to explain why everything rotates around that piece when the reality is you got to realize you're in a bigger game than that. This Christian worldview is the key that unlocks the rest of this book. If you don't believe this, you won't believe the rest of it. And you can't tell me you believe the rest of it if you don't believe the beginning of it. Like, that's not how it works. You can't put your own worldview into God's worldview. He created it, not you. You're not the creator. It's the link that actually connects desire to fulfillment. Because the moment you find out why you were created, what you were created for, and you live by those set natural rules and laws, you're going to all of a sudden realize, oh, this works. And then peace and joy and fulfillment and promise and purpose and health and wholeness and all of these things just all of a sudden work when you use it the way it was intended, when you continue to hold it. Last week during Easter, uh, I used this example, that, or I, I said this, that belief in God leads to pursuit in God that leads to life in God. It's one thing to believe in God, but that belief in God should push you to a pursuit of God. And it's not until you start pursuing God that you actually get to experience life in God. And the same is true on the, on the Christian worldview or the four beliefs that shape every decision is that you can believe them But you have to believe and pursue. You have to actually not just go, I know about them. You have to choose to make a choice to believe them and live by them and live within those parameters. And it's not until then that all of a sudden something's unlocked and it's called life in God. Hebrews 11, 6 says this, For anyone who wants to come to him must first believe that he exists and rewards those who seek so earnestly, sincerely seek him. Like, you can't, Go to God if you don't believe God exists. And if you believe he exists, you have to almost get to the point where it goes, so if he exists and I pursue him, there's got to be some form of a reward in this. Like there has to be a connection base. There has to be something to this. It is the, um, I would say it's the teenager's battle to continually have the conversation with their parents that all the rules in the house are meant to take all the fun away. They're meant to hurt me and wound me. And all these rules are so oppressive. When the reality is, it's not until you get a little bit older that you realize all the rules in the house are actually meant for your benefit. They're they're meant to actually bring you freedom, and you're like, but we don't get freedom with rules. You actually do. And that's the teenager's battle, and the reality is, is that we have a lot of people in this world that believe all the rules are meant to harm us and hurt us and keep us from enjoyment and keep us from freedom. And the rules that God placed on the board of your life are actually meant to get you to a place of purpose and fulfillment not to a place of, like, slavery and oppression. But that only comes through a Christian worldview. If you show us that slide one more time on the, on the four beliefs that shape every decision, I actually believe that these beliefs have life-altering consequences. I believe that the Christian worldview or Christian belief system, we believe that purpose and fulfillment are found in relationship with God, not found in discovery of self. I just believe that. Um, a couple years ago, I think it was during 2020, um, it was just a crazy time in that summer. We were all, you know, we were, I, I actually took two of my kids and we were driving down to Reno and I was talking to Titus, my oldest son, and we were asking, he was asking these questions because all this stuff was coming out about race and, uh, and color and gender and all this stuff just seemed to like boil to the top. And of course, as a, you know, 13 year old boy, he's trying to figure out like, hey, where does it fit in? And, and I have friends who are asking questions. I'm asking questions. Where does this all go? And, and I remember just like, um, as I started to kind of like unfold some of this back to the beginning, as much as I want to be like, hey, here's a statement of faith and here, you know, which, which all fit into a beautiful uh, Christian worldview, it's like, my question was, how do I give them something? To, like, how can I make the decision clear? Because 
so many times you have conversations with people and you're just not on the same page. And you're both trying to speak to the same thing, but you're coming from different directions and you, you're never gonna, it never clicks. Like it just doesn't click. And we send a lot of our kids into school systems where they're having conversations with teachers and or students in which it's just like a big muddy mess. And, and you don't know, like, how do I prepare my kids for this? And what do we do? And so I remember having this conversation with my son who was 13 at the time and just saying, all right, here's a Christian worldview. Let me explain it to you. In the beginning, God created all things. He created them with purpose. He created them for purpose. And he gets to make the rules. I said, that right there is something that you can stand on. And then everything comes out of that. And I said, if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody, they need to know first where you're standing. And then it's okay if they don't agree agree with you or stand on the same thing, but at least they'll know where you're coming from. It's a good conversation to have. And so we started asking these questions. Okay, well, tell me about race. How does it fit into here? Well, if God created all things, all races, and he created them with a purpose and for a purpose, and he gets to determine the rules, then like, who am I to say what does and doesn't matter in race? The only reason people question what matters in race is because we started killing some of those who don't matter and in which said, some do and some don't matter. So now everybody wants to know, well, do I matter? And the reality is in God's kingdom, in the Christian worldview, we don't ask the question who matters. We already know that. Everyone does. Everyone is made with purpose, for a purpose. And when he makes the rules, he makes the design, which means your design reveals your purpose. He created you so perfectly. Everything about you, your height, I was going to say your weight, but sometimes you guys need to know you're in control of that, you know? (laughs) Let's just say your body shape, yeah? Your body shape, there we go. Like your hair, your skin, your eyes, every single piece of you was created for the purpose in which he has for you. So whatever it is, that's it. He's the one who created it. So we don't ask the question who matters and who doesn't. We know everyone does, and every ounce of you, piece of you, is created with a purpose and for a purpose. We just believe that. We say, okay, well, what about gender? Well, who gets to make the rules? Who gets to choose? God, if you choose to believe in a Christian worldview. But if you don't have a Christian worldview and you believe that you're the one trying to find your purpose, you're the one trying to determine the value of your life, the purpose of your life, if you matter or don't matter, and you're the one trying to pick all the rules, the reality is is that, sure, you can pick all you want. But if you choose to believe in a Christian worldview, we choose to trust in a God who's already created all that. And that's what we hold on to. And you can't believe one of these and not the other. The reality is that they're all four linked together. If God created you, and he created you with purpose, and he set the rules, then your response is not to simply believe. Your response is to actually go, okay, now I want to seek to know. Like, I'd like to know what the story is. Your design reveals your purpose, which means when you look at a car, you can see the design of that car reveals the purpose of that car. A car makes a horrible paperweight makes a horrible pet, makes a horrible lot of things. But when you turn the car on and you use it for its intended use and purpose, it's awesome. If they're going to design a car that'll go 150 miles per hour, you should use it at 150 miles per hour. Yeah? Yes! (laughs) Yeah. And if you want to buy a moped, shame on you, right? Get out of the way. That's what I'm saying. It's true. Your design reveals your purpose, which means a hammer has a design. And a hammer is good for some things, but not all things. A book has a design, and the reality is your gender, your race, your place, everything about you, where you were born, everything reveals the purpose in which God has placed for you. And so instead of choosing our own purpose and our own path, embracing it is the Christian way. But not everybody believes that. And that's okay. That's their choice. I want to say that identity is only found in Christ. We believe that. That's what a Christian worldview says. We don't believe that it's by chance. We don't believe that your identity is by choice. We don't believe that identity is found through sexual exploration. We don't believe that it's found through desire and is found through fulfillment. We believe, a Christian worldview believes that identity is only found in Christ. And there's such a beauty in that. There's a beauty in relenting 
and saying, okay, God, if, you des- if you're the one who designed it and you're the one who has all this intentionality, then speak to me. What is, my, what is my purpose? What is the intentionality? What do you have for me? And we don't fight against what God has for us and the rules. We actually learn to embrace them and say, but I'll miss my purpose if I change my design. If we desire to live well and live well with others, we actually have to get back to this in our culture. We have to now filter everything that we do and all the choices that we make through a Christian worldview, and we've got to learn to teach our kids the same. And when you choose to teach your kids a Christian worldview and the belief that God created everything with purpose, for purpose, and he gets to design the rules, what's amazing, and this is the beauty of, of really, I think, the Christian life, is all the pressures released from you. You don't have to define purpose for everyone. You don't have to redefine it. You don't have to have an opinion on every social issue. You don't have to come up with a new way of thinking. You don't have to like have a response to everybody's question, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Or what does God say about this? And I know with my kids, I try to teach them this one response because we live in a world that wants to know, well, what's your opinion on this? Well, what do you think about this? And what do you, what do you think God thinks about this? And maybe you've had these conversations, maybe you haven't, but I've had people come and ask my kids this question. They ask me this question. They say, well, what, what does God believe about this? What is, why does God hate this? What does he hope for in this? And, and they're trying to get these opinions out of you as if you were God. And I taught my kids, this is how we answer those questions. You're asking the right question to the wrong person. I'm not God. And if you really want to know what he hates and what he loves, you should ask him. Because I'm not him. I don't speak for him. I don't, you know, like, he's God. He set the rules. I'm not the one who has to be like the, the mean, well, here's the rules, and you got to live by them. No, no, no. You're asking the right question. Because it's obviously coming out of a, something in your heart to know, am I right, am I wrong, what am I doing, where's my purpose, what's my plan, design, like you're actually feeling something in there, and that's good, but you're just asking the wrong person, I'm the wrong person, I told my son, I think just recently, I said, you should let them know, asking a 15-year-old for life advice is probably not (laughs) your best plan, (laughs) go to God, go to God and ask him, To be honest, I think we're wearing out our society. We're wearing out teachers, politicians, lawyers. We're wearing out our leaders. We're wearing out our parents, trying to treat everybody as if they're God. They have to come up with a new rule and a new solution to every single problem. We're wearing people out. If we would just embrace the fact that you you are not God. The government's not God. Parents are not God. Lawyers are not God. And we go to them, lawyers, tell us what to do this. How do we do this? How do we... Oh, my word, like, just let God be God. Let him make the rules. Let him set the rules. Let him clarify all the rules. Let him clarify purpose and meaning. And in in, in the womb, you were formed with purpose before every day of your life happened. He knew it, and he planned it, and he forethought it. Like, tell me that doesn't speak to intentionality. Tell me that doesn't speak to purpose. God is the one who determines purpose, not I, not you, not YouTube, not Google, not the government, not the school. Nobody gets to determine purpose, only the one who created it. We have to ask him, what is the purpose? God's the one who made the rules, not me. I'm not the bad guy. God made the rules. He set the boundaries. I wanna encourage you to let God be God to learn his ways and to follow them. But the choice is still yours to make. Are you going to be God or let God be God? And I know in our own situation, our own life, like we hold on to it so dearly of like, but I want to make my own choices. I want to make my own, I want to determine my own destiny. I want to figure it out. There's just a beautiful like joy that comes the moment that you recognize it's not yours to figure out. It's yours to discover. It's yours to follow. It's yours to learn. And the moment your kids come to you, you don't have that pressure of like, hey, we've got to learn this, and here's where you've got to go to school, and we've got to determine this, we've got to make this thing happen. Like, instead of you having all the answers, why don't you just communicate to the people in your life, whether it's your spouse or your kids or your family members or people who look to you, I don't have all the answers but I know someone who does. I don't know what your purpose is. I don't know where my kids are supposed to go to college. I don't know what they're supposed to do for a career. I don't know all of these things. Why? Because I'm not God. 
And instead of looking to me, I want to now point you to him. He knows your purpose. He knows your design. He's so intentional with every aspect of your life. He placed you in a very specific place on this planet, in a very specific family, for a very specific reason, at a very specific time, with all of the things that are entailed in you. And maybe you're sitting there going, well, maybe it was all an accident. It wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. And you may look at yourself in the mirror and think, man, this this guy, well, I'm like, hey. But (laughs) not really. (laughs) All of us question God in ourselves, don't we? But God, why did you put me in that family? But God, why did you let this happen? Oh, but God, why did you... God, why did you, but God, why did you? Maybe he's just bigger and better than that. And maybe he sees your role in the world he created. And it's so pivotal and so instrumental and so meaningful and so purposeful. And instead of fighting him, what if you just embraced it and said, okay, God, I'm okay to be a piece instead of the piece. I'm okay with what you have for me. I embrace the things you've given me and the boundaries you've set. And I choose to submit my will to your will. That's the beauty of living in a Christian worldview is that it releases all the pressure from you. And not only that, you realize you can't do all be all. Hence, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross as a payment for your sin that you could never pay for nor want to. He had a design and a reason for sending Jesus to earth. And when Jesus gave his life for the forgiveness of sins, sure it wasn't right, but he did it anyway for your behalf and because he loved you. And the moment that you give your heart to him, you repent of your sin in your way, and you say, okay, God, would you come? Would you repurpose me, reintend me? The word, the word um, redemption actually means to set back on purpose, to redeem back to its original purpose. And it's when we submit our will to his will, we fall in line with really his design and his purpose and his rules and his ways. That's the moment that we're redeemed. All of a sudden you go, hey, this works, that works, this clicks, that clicks. Like what in the world's going on here? And desire leads to fulfillment because fulfillment is only found in relationship with Jesus. So I'm gonna take a moment to pray. We'll finish out this today. And I know for, maybe you're, maybe you're sitting to yourself thinking, man, that was hard truth. Maybe for some of you, you go, I don't know if I for, for sure like believe all four of those things. I still have questions. I still, I still want to know what part do I get to be in charge? <laughs> it's okay if you wrestle with this. It's okay. It's your life and it's important to you. It's important to us and it's actually important to him. But to wrestle through this and to be able to stand on a firm foundation to know that it is only in and through Jesus Christ that you will ever find fulfillment, purpose, design, function, peace, joy. That could be a hard message, but it also could be a life-giving message. And you don't have to be God. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be everything. But when you rest in his ways, he has it all figured out. And it's for your good. But it all starts with belief in God. Belief in his ways and belief in Jesus Christ. So I just want to take a moment and challenge you with the question, do you believe that he exists? Do you believe he created all things? Do you believe that he created all things, including you, with intentionality and purpose? Do you believe that all things, including yourself, have a purpose? And have you submitted your will to his and said, God, I'll let you be God. You you make the rules. And I will follow you as my leader. That's what it means to actually be saved. That's what it means to live in freedom. That's what it means to find purpose and meaning and it's not until we do that that we'll find that we are living in fulfillment, living in joy living in peace so I want to encourage you right now just to even submit your life to his, to have a conversation with him a prayer with him, says God I choose to believe 
I choose to build my life on this foundation, on the foundation of your word. And even when I don't understand, I don't know, instead of trying to figure it out myself, I'm just going to lean into you and say, God, what do you have next? For I give my life to you, my soul to you, and I I repent, which means I let my ways go, and I choose to submit to your ways, your rules, and your laws. And in this way, I become a Christ follower. And so we give it to you. In Jesus' name.